And good morning, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Backers, joined by a, ske- a special guest this afternoon, Sergio Scari- Scariolo. And uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thanks for joining me. You have a, quite a history in coaching basketball. I wonder if you would just give everybody um, some some background as to how you came to work for the Raptors and also the Spanish national team. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, you pronounce it pretty well. Sergio Scariolo, my name. Uh, yeah, I'm a Toronto Raptors assistant coach and the Spanish national team um, head coach. Um, well, I started like everybody. Start playing basketball. Um, I got I got an injury. I broke my Achilles. Start to you know coach uh, kids. Uh, just to you know spend my time during during the rehab. Uh, I like it. I start to love it. And um, uh, well, I I get back playing for two three years, but at the same time I was still coaching um, kids. And then when I basically when I get uh, to college, I started to work professionally in uh, basketball as a assistant coach and uh, uh, head coach on of of. Uh, uh, you know, under 14, under 15, under 16 teams. Um, and then I, I started moving. I mean, I, I left my, my city, Brescia, which is uh, 200,000 uh, people city nearby Milan. Uh, and I started my, my professional career for four, four more years as assistant coach. Then at 28, I became head coach in, the, in a really high-level team in, the, in Italian basketball. Actually, we won the championship on on that first year and uh, you know a few more years in Italy and then I went to Spain coaching club teams um, let's say two three top level teams including Real Madrid for four years and then from there <clears throat> I went to Russia I spent three years in Russia wow. Moscow. and then I started to coach national team as well I mean I was sharing my head coach uh, team club in Russia first in Milan after uh, with uh, the head coaching job of the Spanish national team started in 2009 I quit in 2012 for a couple of, for a couple of years and now I restarted in 2014 again with the national team until 2000 uh, was summer 2018 when uh, the Raptors proposal um, came out and uh, actually all the conditions I was looking for, all the, all the let's say, parameter of the mm-hmm. uh, needs I was feeling, uh, I, I I need to, you know, for for to make this this decision, were uh, included into that proposal. So I made a decision. I kept the Spanish national team job, uh, uh, but I start to work in the Nick Nurse staff. Uh, uh, as as assistant coach, and and this is up to now. So, looking at your responsibilities now with the Toronto Raptors, what is your day to day job? Well, I am uh, uh, in charge of offense, which is okay. Um, say, uh, understand uh, first of all uh, Nick system. You know, Nick was coming from. Uh, his uh, last uh, couple of years with a huge responsibility um, as, a, as an offensive coordinator in, mm-hmm. uh, uh, in Dwayne, Dwayne Casey um, staff. And so the first job was, was really understanding it, uh, try to uh, add some of, of my ideas, you know, bringing them from my own experience and from Europe, but of course, within the, the, the general philosophy uh, of, of uh, coach nurse at the same time I can say that our philosophy are very close so it was not a, a, a too difficult for me and basically this is my my job actually prepare our offensive game plan uh, prepare the pre-game the post-game edit uh, the, the halftime edit uh, you know give my ideas and, and and bring into the timeouts my suggestions about uh, what what to run with with players which wrinkles and uh, and but that basically it. I mean during during uh, uh, the whole regular season and then in play in the playoff, uh, of course the game game preparation is even you know deeper and and more detailed because you play 
you know, every couple of days against the same team. So you get to a level of, of knowledge of that team really high, not having to change every day the opponent. And that's the, probably the most fun part. You have this responsibility with the Raptors and a lot of time and effort goes into doing that. But then you're also the, the head national coach for the Spanish team. How do you juggle those responsibilities? Well, it's uh, adding more hours. I mean, it's just that there's no no secrets. You know, it just if you love this 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 game as I do, and and I I feel I'm blessed because mm-hmm. really uh, to me it's not it's not a problem to add more time and to dig a little bit deeper and to watch a little bit more games and 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 or to rewatch something or to ask for my my people to send me some stuff. And, and to you know think over reflect of, over that and um, it, it's it's a pleasure I mean it's a hobby it's really a hobby uh, of course it's a it, it's, it's a tough one as well because there are really tough uh, moments of the season when you are I don't know in a back to back when you have to to you know have a twelve hours working day uh, otherwise you can't you won't be able to deliver your 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 what you have to uh, but. Again, it's it's a it's a really it's a really fun and uh, a couple of times during the year I got to go back to Spain for one week because there are kind of a qualification games for right. the next European Championship or for the World Championship and during the summer of course we have the main activity with the national team with uh, let's say three four weeks training camp and uh, three weeks competition which can be European Championship World Championship like last summer. Or Olympic Games, like it was supposed to be this summer, and is hopefully going to be next summer. So we, we do have a question for you from Adrian Griffin, who was a guest on this show, and he says, "What were your biggest challenges as a coach coming from Europe to the NBA?" Well, I got to tell you, and 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 Ag Ag knows it because he he was very very supportive, extremely helpful for me. Uh, it, it still is, but especially in the first three, four months, that was really tough because I had to adjust, first of all, to a new, a new position. After mm. 30 years as a, as a, as a head coach, um, that was kind of a readjusting. Fortunately, I had spent a few years before becoming head coach as an as a assistant coach with different head coaches. So I had already an experience as an assistant coach. There are you know coaches who started uh, like head coaches, of course, in at the, the lower level, then they uh, raise their level, but still, still being head coaches. And uh, it, my my case is that was was a starting coaching uh, young teams, and at the same time being assistant coach with the main team, with the, with the pro team. So I I had to take out of the drawer that that experience, and and and, and that was helpful, but. Uh, for the most of, uh, of what I have to learn, uh, it was completely new uh, mm-hmm. terminology, uh, dynamics into the coaching staff. Um, as I said, we had just to have somebody above you which may like your ideas or who, who may not like them, but at the same time, that shouldn't be an issue, never, uh, you know, to you know, prevent you from take out the new ideas immediately after because that, that's absolutely natural. Something something can be done immediately, something can be done later on, or something maybe uh, may not be liked from your head coach. And you have to be absolutely uh, ready to accept it and, and, and do it in a very natural way. Uh, technology, so we get, I have to uh, absolutely adjust. When you are a head coach, you are most of, most of a receiver. Of, of other other guys, uh, technology, uh, technology, well done jobs. When you are assistant coach, you have to you know uh, be the one who, who prepare you know the edit, the the reports, and all the stuff. But um, I, I think I've been really really uh, blessed from, from uh, having myself into a new challenge. That's that really was really refreshing. Do something new, mm. something which I was not able to do what I thought I was I was not able to do but then at the beginning I really was not able to do then after a few weeks a couple of months three months 
I learn and I start to try to to, to do things in a in a you know in the way which they should uh, be done in the NBA, not not exactly like I, I was used to do them in Europe. And and then I felt start feeling really comfortable into what we are. What, I mean, I had great, unbelievable support from our uh, you know head coach, other assistant coaches, as I said, AG. Adrian was one of the most uh, helpful and supportive on this. Uh, uh, basically, it was like, uh, 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 you know, dive in a, in a completely uh, unknown waters. But at the same time, this is what I was looking for. After 30 years as a head coach, I felt that I, need, I needed to get back in a very, very, very close touch, close contact with the game. When you are a head coach, you start to deal with media. With personality handling uh, groups and, and, and the team buildings, all the stuff which is, I mean, commercial stuff, and and this, you know, what it do now is taking you a little bit away from the game, and you don't really realize it. It's just a, a daily getting one inch away from the game, and and I felt that what I was really needed was go back very very, I mean, really into the game, deeply into the game, and that. Sure, it's much easier when you are an assistant coach and you don't have to uh, carry the burden of all those responsibilities, extra responsibilities, which are not strictly basketball, you know, strategy, technique, and, and uh, the, 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 say, the, the pure basketball part of our job. Mm. There's definitely differences between being a, a head coach and an assistant coach. One of the things with being a a national team coach is this idea that um, you have to choose the players. Whereas with being an assistant coach, the players are there and you have to work with the players you have. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you choose um, the best players? And we've got a little static on your, um, your feed. Could you move your camera a little bit? I think it's near some, some electrical equipment, maybe. Well, um, it's not black and white. I mean, uh, with, uh, with uh, of course, if you are an assistant coach, you are, and, and in the NBA, there is much more separation uh, overall between uh, choosing player and building up rosters. Uh, uh, that is more of a of a front off job. Of course, uh, they they ask for coaches' opinion, but it's more of a of a front off job. The national team is true that you can choose players, but at the same time, uh, I would say that uh, probably in our reality in Spain, probably in, in the US is a little bit different. But in Spain, uh, eight or nine are are no brainer. I mean, they are they are. Uh, we don't have. Have, uh, unfortunately, 50 top level players uh, to choose among, uh, among them. Uh, we have a limited, amount, a limited number of uh, uh, top players. And of course, those are it. Whoever, whoever probably would be the head coach. And then you have to finish up your roster, uh, you know, picking up the right role players. Which are going to complement your team, and that that's probably the most difficult part of our job. Even even uh, from a from a personal point of view, because you have a, uh, let's say ten in the training camp, and you have to say to eight or seven of them at the end of the training camp where they really work hard to make to make a spot in the roster. That they, 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 unfortunately they didn't make. It. This, that's really the worst part of, of my job because you can see these guys were really so hungry, so so uh, driving, and they, they want to, to make it, and then you got to make a choice. And, and as I said, there are just, I would say, two or three, better case scenario, there are two or three really available spots every year, because the other eight or nine are basically filled up from from the, the let's say, top players, NBA players, top Euro League players. So that's really, really, I mean, you have to make you know, you have to have your own criteria. You have to listen to your assistant coach. Uh, but it's more of a uh, chemistry issue than than just a talent evaluation issue. It's just 
So you're not just choosing the ones you believe are, are better uh, fitting into the, the, you know, the situation you have. And, and, uh, and even players who are, would be available of sitting on the bench and not, not being rotation players and stay there ready. Maybe for whatever reason they have to step up and play, or maybe they won't. So they have to just bring uh, you know, positivity and enthusiasm and, and good energy to the team, even if they, they, they won't really participate the, to the real, real uh, uh, great, great, the, the biggest amount of playing time. Mm. You, you talked about having your players. I, I can't really hear. I mean, the, okay. the connection of your mic, the microphone can you, is. Can you oh, move can you your, your camera a little bit? Sorry? Can you move your camera a little bit? I think is it too close to like a piece of equipment. It's, it's no, I you can hear like that's better. Yeah, I'm I'm hearing some some feedback. Okay, well, I I, I try to make an effort. I'll try to make an effort to to understand your questions. Okay, I um, can you can you talk about your coaching philosophy? Well, when you have coaching for so many years and when you have you have, have gone through so many experiences in different countries with different players at different levels, uh, the first thing you learn is that uh, you like to have your principles, your values, but you have to have uh, uh, flexibility. Mm. Uh, I've seen so many great coaches uh, fail. Uh, because they were uh, really uh, too rigid, too too strong on 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 you know, sticking to their let's say uh, philosophy, uh, and not being able to make that uh, little adjustment you had to do every day or every season according to to uh, your roster that year that season roster. That's one one of the things I I. Have to learn. I mean, you of course you have your main principle. The main principle probably are not different from coach to coach. I mean, you want probably you want the team where players like to share the ball. Uh, unselfishness is another main value uh, where people are are really willing to work on defense. They are really willing to do the the. You know, the third job, which is not showing up in the stats uh, unless they are very advanced stats. Uh, maybe, um, let's say, people who uh, have uh, won already, which have gone through the winning experience, so they are really able to, to uh, you know, transfer that, that, that feeling that, uh, and what it takes. To win to other guys, um, uh, I mean, I, I I don't want to say too many really uh, strict principles because these are basically my principles. Have have I mean, feeling like my team is a team, feeling like if, if other people watch my team play, uh, they can say, okay, these guys have an advantage. They play as a team and and they they try hard. These are basically the, the, the main principle. Then you can be you can play with four perimeter players on one side or two inside and three out or with a point guard or with two point guard or three. Uh, you know the, you can have thousands of different and, and you have to be uh, smart enough to understand what your players of that specific team in that specific roster are really good at and, and try to explode. Their potential, mm. say, close to the to the high peak of of, of, uh, of their possibilities. I mean, this is uh, I, I don't believe, frankly, that a coach is somebody who got to say, okay, my principles are A, B, C, D, E. Whatever you guys are able or not able to do, you got to do this. I mean, this is this is this is not something which is realistic, in my opinion, especially in the pro sport. Maybe in college. 
you can you can on high school stuff like that you could uh, get to that point maybe I'm talking a little bit from the from the outside but for sure not in pro sport. What would you say is one of the biggest challenges you have as a coach, either in the NBA or with the Spanish national team? I think the, big, the biggest challenge is um, to feel able to help your players to win. I mean, that the feel and have the feedback, of course, from them, which are which are the, the real ones who, who can judge, not the not the media, not the, you know, sometimes not even the front office. Not, I mean, the players are your, the, the ones who are really able to judge your job, especially the, 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 the more veteran one, the ones who have been around for a while, I think working with, with many coaches, and they immediately feel if you can be a positive factor for that team, somebody who can really help them to, to win and to get, uh, to reach, their goals a little bit easier. Um, so that's, that's basically the main goal, having the feeling uh, which is coming from yourself, evaluating your, your own performance. Uh, not, mm-hmm. not easy, but you can get there after, after a few years in this profession. And from your players, especially the more reliable one, that you are, you are uh, helpful. You, you are not big, you're, you're not the go-to. Guy. You're not a superstar of the team. You're just a factor who can help the other guys to perform uh, close to the best of their possibilities. This is a challenge. Feeling useful. Feeling really, really useful. But there's there's some players it's difficult for them to feel. Useful. Can you can you? Be the question, Tim. Sorry, I, I, I lost you for a while. When? Yeah, sorry. The the question was, you know, some players may not get much playing time. They may not get much opportunities. They may be on the bench a lot. How do you make them feel part of the team? Well, for I was I will start one step uh, behind this uh, or before. Uh, you get that. Mm, especially, especially in a, uh, in a national team, but I would say also in the, in the NBA, uh, you got to be fair with your players when you promise them the role they will have into, into the team, right? Then, of course, this, this uh, situation is dynamic. I mean, it can change because some player will overperform, some other player will underperform, but you can't change your mind after two games. If a player had two great games, just, just make him change completely his role into the team. If a player had the two bad games, just put him on the bench forever. I mean, you have to be solid. You have to be consistent. And, and really give the opportunity uh, to, you, to your players to, uh, you know, get into the role you, you have envisioned for them. And, and, and be able to, to master it and to, to uh, keep it. I mean, at the same time, you have to, your eyes must be open to, to really see the, uh, how they are performing and how, how the guys who are maybe having, who are maybe having less playing time uh, right now are, are really improving. Uh, you, you, you must see their, their body language, their performance in practice. Uh, the team needs according to their, their specific skills. So this is a dynamic thing, but at the same time, you have to be loyal to your play. The, the least, I mean, the, the, worst, really the worst thing um, you want is that your player will ever tell you, you promise something which you didn't deliver. Maybe under promise, I mean, I never, I never if I believe the player can play 20 minutes, I have 10 shots, just to make a you know, very, very gross example. I would pro- probably tell him 18 and 9. But I got to make sure that in my initial scheme, they will really have in their hands uh, the chance to, uh, uh, you know, to get what I promised them. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have to have a loyal and 
and a straight and open relationship with them to be able to tell them, listen, uh, you are not doing what we what we agree on, on you to do to keep your position. You are, I mean, I need you to do more of this, better of that. And and and, and uh, I get I gotta give other guys an opportunity. Mm. And you don't have to hide it uh, behind uh, you know Cinderella stories or excuses or nice laughs in front and then and then you know just say hey be straight listen mm. we, we said we, I, I I told you from the very beginning that I needed A B and C from you now you are not you are given eighty percent A seventy percent B and sixty percent C <clears throat> and in easy now our job is easy to show the prior uh, clips images, stats, advanced stats, to, to prove that, that you are fair, saying that, sorry, but I got to reduce your playing time. You got to start off the bench <clears throat> because we have another guy who has the right to try if he can fit better into, into our team needs than you. And you probably have another opportunity later on. This is not a, a door which closes forever. But it, I mean, the, the, the thing is that if you are fair with them, you can really keep players uh, on the bench. For sure, they will not be uh, happy. But uh, at the same time, you get to reward them for what they do. Uh, unfortunately, not in a playing, really game playing time, in practices, in, in, the, in how they could contribute to the team good spirit on the bench. In the trips, in, in the, you know, advising younger, maybe, you know, more talented player. This is the reason why they are playing, but bringing their experience to the table and helping them improve. I mean, there are many, many ways, well, uh, uh, many ways to help uh, from somebody who's not really have a big playing time into your office. But you got to make sure they, they uh, see, they do notice that. They got to hear you. You reward in that and for what they do, uh, uh, you know, and and, and uh, you know, talk to them, be 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 care, you know, them, and and, and be, be really interested in how they're doing, how their families are doing. I mean, it's a little bit uh, more difficult because you need more more time and really keeping your mind that you cannot talk just with the with your eight, nine, ten main rotation player. You got to show to the other guy that as a human being. Everybody's the same, of course, not as a, as a professional player, because our best players are, are, will not have the same money, the same playing time, the same shots, or our playing number 14. But as a human, they got to have the perception that you treat them, let's say, pretty consistently in the same way. If, if you look back on your coaching career and experiences, what advice do you have for, for those who are looking to become coaches or improve as coaches? Well, uh, this is a vocational job, first of all. You got to feel that voice. And, and that's a, what the, if, you, if you are blessed uh, and lucky enough, like I feel like I am, to feel that voice loud uh, now as it was when you started, when you made the decision. That's probably the the you know the uh, best fuel you can you can uh, still use to to you know put hours and make you know sacrifices and and, and work hard and, and even uh, just you know be sometimes in a position which you feel you don't deserve. Uh, I mean, in in, in a way that uh, you, you you see other other people who are maybe in position which you. You deserve more, but you got to keep your ego under control. You got to be patient, take your time, and, and know that there are no shortcuts. This is not okay. Relationships are important. You got to, you know, <clears throat> cultivate your relationships and be smart enough to be to be a good person and to and to you know treat people in the right way. But what is really mattering is the quality of your performance. Somebody sooner or sooner or late will not sit. So, first of all, no shortcuts. Just work hard, work at different system calls, work with loyalty and 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 uh, really hard for your head coach 
because it's, you are not really working for him. You are working for your team. And if you, if you are a team player, like you demand your players to be, you have to be the one first, giving the example to everybody, showing how to be a good team player. Second, I would say, be able to listen. Everybody wants to, to you know, communicate this way. Like, hey, I tell you what to do. This is my idea. Why don't you do this? Well, the, I, I learned uh, over my skin at the beginning, especially, that you have, you must be able to listen first. The players, especially, they will give you the keys uh, uh, to touch when you will, when it's going to be time to, uh, you know, back for uh, the extra effort. That really, really um, big sacrifice. The, the, the go through the pain, go through fatigue, um, be in a, in a role, be a role player, even if you be that you can be, you know, a main, a main player. There are many things which uh, uh, players can uh, uh, do only if they are really motivated. And not the, not every player is motivated from from or drives from the same motivation. There are players who need just a peer uh, support and, and, and consideration. Players who need a coach rewarding them in front of the other guys uh, because they want their boss. Be, be happy with them. Players who need, uh, you know, a salary uh, reward. Uh, players who need media headlines. So you got to go in press conference. And don't forget that you got to say a word about that uh, because about about them because they need it. I mean, there are many different, many, you know, few different ways. And if you are able to listen, uh, mm -hmm. make your job way easier. You don't have to invent or be constantly thinking, hey, what is going to be. Uh, really motivating for these guys. Just sit down, listen to them. They will give you the keys, and they will probably uh, show you what's the, what's the best way to, to you know to bring that specific player to uh, the ultimate le ultimate level of their uh, uh, working capacity and or their uh, performing capacity. Hmm. Uh, that's that's great advice, and I know that. Um you know, you you have coached in different countries as well, which a lot of coaches have never done. Have you had any communication issues with uh, language barriers? Um, well, um, that's a good question because people tend to underrate this. Of course, if you're coaching in, in North America, it's not a big deal. Right. This is not not never going to become a, <clears throat> uh, a big issue. But if you, as you said, you know, travel and, and coach in different countries, you gotta, uh, if you feel that communicate with people, with person is, is important, uh, at least at the same level of, of telling them what they have to do, making them more or less understand what you want on the floor, on a pure from a pure basketball standpoint, you got to try to get close to them, um, trying to speak their own language. I mean, I can't, I can't demand my player to speak Italian, right? I, mean, right. I can't send them, you know, like uh, uh, speed uh, classes of, 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 of uh, Italian because because that's that's uh, ridiculous. Uh, I remember when when I first changed. From Italy to Spain, I studied Spain for a whole year. I felt that basketball was slowing down in Italy and growing up very fast in Spain. From my last year in, in Italy, I started. I, I took classes. I took classes, and mm -hmm. and and uh, I, I studied Spain for for one one year. When I went to Russia, I was lucky because basically I kind of a, a commit almost one year before getting there, so I had time to study Russian. And when I get there, I kept studying Russian. Uh, not because I, I felt that I could ever get to speak really fluent Russian, which is difficult. But I, I really very quickly realized that my players were appreciating the effort. That, that I had, if I had to communicate something in a passionate way, I had to, you know, touch them uh, using their own words. You know, not mine, because mine was but like, hey, the guy is screaming. The guy is, <laughs> is 
man, you guys happy, but what is really saying? And, and even coming to, to the NBA, it was kind of a challenge because uh, the basketball league, English, we speak in Europe, is not the same as, as uh, the, you know, the basketball English that uh, people speak in the NBA. So that was a big, really, really huge adjustment. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to improve my vocabulary. I, I know that I will never be able to speak perfect English and I will always be speaking with an accent. But I think that the people see my my effort trying to, to get better and trying to get closer to them. Not not you know demanding that they get closer to me in their house, you know, which is US or Canada. Um, at least they will appreciate the effort and they will try themselves to make an effort to understand me better, even if my pronunciation is not perfect or even if I can make a grammar uh, mistake every now and then. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Coach, thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm sure if people have questions, they can contact you on, on Twitter or social media for more information. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, like it was a pleasure and uh, great, great to join you back. Thank you. And just a reminder, on Monday, we have Sean Mason, who will be on our show. He is an American Ninja Warrior athlete and coach. As a competitor and a coach, we'll be talking to him about that life. Um, so on behalf of myself and uh, Coach Sergio, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys.